God bless the United States. <laughs> I'm your host, Anna Kasparian, and oh no, I'm here by myself. That could only mean one thing. We've got some election related updates to get to, so we will do that in just a moment. Later in the show, though, we have a lot of other topics to get to, including updates on the war on Gaza. We're also gonna talk about, well, some of the more ludicrous footage that's emerged from the Gaza Strip featuring Palestinian men stripped down to their underwear. More war crimes being committed, we're gonna get to that later in the show as well. We're also gonna talk a little bit about free speech on college campuses and this new trend of university presidents being pressured to essentially step down and resign from their positions due to various student protests that have been taking place on their campuses. So we're gonna get to all of that in the first hour. Second hour of the show, don't miss it. We're gonna talk about, well, the youngest lawyer in California. He passed the bar at 17 years old and we're gonna have a discussion about whether or not he's wasting his life away. <laughs> so don't miss that, that'll be in the second hour of the show. As always, just want to encourage you all to like and share the stream if you haven't done so already. It's a free and easy way to help support TYT and get our message out into the world. You can also support us and get all sorts of fun exclusive content by going to tyt.com slash join by becoming a member. And you can also join by clicking on that join button if you're watching us on YouTube. All right, without further ado, let's get into the latest round of electoral dysfunction, of course, involving President Joe Biden and his chances at getting reelected. A new Wall Street Journal poll indicates that Nikki Haley, the Republican candidate running in the Republican primary for president, would absolutely crush Joe Biden in a hypothetical one on one matchup. Now, I know what you're all thinking. Well, Nikki Haley is unlikely to win the Republican primary given Donald Trump's massive lead. You're right about that, we'll get to that in just a moment. But I do think these hypothetical situations are telling because oftentimes we talk about Trump and the matchup with Trump and Biden and the numbers are not good for Biden in that case. They're even worse when it comes to someone like Nikki Haley. Gives you a sense of where the hearts and minds of American voters are at the moment. Now, according to the Wall Street Journal, Haley, a former South Carolina governor and UN ambassador, tops Biden in a test matchup by 17 points, guys. 17 points, 51% to 34% compared with Trump's four point lead. So, he does have a four point lead in, in this poll, but I think it's also really important to talk about how that lead um, is impacted by the third party candidates as well. But before we get to that, let's take a quick look at how unlikely the Biden Haley matchup happens to be. What you're about to look at is the real clear politics average of polls. It, it gives you a sense of where the Republican candidates currently stand in the Republican primary. So this real clear politics average of polls shows that Trump has a 47.6 point lead um, over the second place Republican who is Ron DeSantis still, but not by much. Haley comes in at third place with 12.4 points to Trump's 60.3 points. And so, if you look at the Wall Street Journal poll, what they also find is that in a hypothetical matchup with Biden and DeSantis, they actually tie. So if Republicans were making decisions based on who the best candidate is to beat Joe Biden, Ron DeSantis would not be it. Ron DeSantis, based on the average of poll, based on the Wall Street Journal poll, would basically have a tie with Joe Biden. But that is not the case with Haley, she leads Biden by 17. And it's not the case when it comes to Donald Trump either. So let's take a look at the rest of the poll, okay? So this graph will give you a sense of how American voters feel about Trump versus Biden. It asks if the 2024 presidential election were held today, whom would you vote for? 
And Biden would only garner 31% of the vote. And as you can see, the polling includes the third party candidates here as well. RFK Jr. takes about 8% of the vote and about 14% of the respondents to this poll are undecided. So again, if the election were held today, 37% of these voters would go for Donald Trump and only 31% would go for Joe Biden. And by the way, there's no indication that these third party candidates are planning on dropping out before the election day comes up, right? So that is having an impact on the numbers for Biden. But even if they did, even if those third party candidates decided to drop out, Here's what would happen. Biden lags behind Trump by four percentage points, 47% to 43% on a hypothetical ballot with only those two candidates. So Biden is still in a lot of trouble when you consider how much of a lead Donald Trump has, how poor Joe Biden's approval rating continues to be. Biden is in fact seen unfavorably by the majority of voters. Only 23% of voters, according to the Wall Street Journal's poll, say Biden's policies have helped them personally, while 53% say they have been hurt by the president's agenda. By contrast, about half of voters say Trump's policies, um, say Trump's policies when he was president helped them personally. More than 37% who say they were hurt. Now, some 37% approve of Biden's job performance. Which is a low number, guys. It is low in journal polling during his presidency, while 61% see his overall image in an unfavorable light, a record high. Bidenomics, the president's signature economic platform, is viewed favorably by less than 30% of voters and unfavorably by more than half. Now, the real issue here for the respondents is Biden's handling of the economy. And honestly, this is an area where I think Biden is being treated a little unfairly. But what's at the heart of their disdain for the economy is honestly inflation. I've talked about this quite a bit before, and that's certainly reflected in this poll as well. So let's take a look at the next graph. And it'll show you the areas in which the respondents trust Trump over Biden. And in almost every category, the respondents prefer Trump over Biden. They trust Trump to handle the economy better. They trust Trump to handle inflation, crime, border security, and even the Israel Hamas war better than Biden's been handling it. Whether you agree with them or not, that doesn't matter. What matters is what the respondents to this poll are saying. The only two areas in which Biden actually does better than Trump Unsurprisingly includes abortion, so reproductive rights. Understandably, most Americans are pretty furious over the reversal of Roe v. Wade and what that has led to in various red states, effective abortion bans in various states. There's a story that we're gonna cover today on today's show about a woman in Texas who needed an emergency abortion and was denied after she found out that she was carrying a non-viable fetus. So there is a lot of there's a political liability for the Republican Party when it comes to reproductive rights. And so one argument is that Biden should focus on that in his campaigning and kind of move away from Bidenomics. Because as he brags about Bidenomics, what tends to happen is the individuals who feel the brunt of inflation, the economic burdens that come along with the inflation. They get more and more frustrated, more and more angry. There's nothing more frustrating than hearing that the economy is doing well when you yourself and your household are experiencing something entirely different. But they do, again, trust Biden on abortion and also apparently tone in politics. So even Trump supporters will admit that they don't like the way he conducts himself, the way that he carries himself in public. They didn't like the way that he would tweet or some of his social media posts, but they liked his policies. The situation is reversed when it comes to Biden. They think that Biden has the right tone in politics, but they're not really in favor of the policies he's implemented. Now, Michael Bosian, a Democratic pollster, said that Biden is falling short with several groups who would consistently vote Democratic, young voters and black and Latino voters, something that we've talked about quite a bit on this show. They are feeling economically stressed and challenged right now, and they are not showing enthusiasm in the way they were turning out in 2020 and 2022, he said. 
And I think he's right about that. I think we're seeing it, especially with some of the numbers we're experiencing with the black and Latino vote. More and more of these voters are kind of reconsidering their support for the Democratic Party. And they are in fact considering voting for a Republican in the general election. Now with all of that said, I wanna go back to Nikki Haley. Because think about how much of a threat a Trump Haley ticket would pose to Joe Biden. Now remember, Donald Trump is considering a woman as his running mate. I think it would be incredibly smart for him to choose Nikki Haley considering how popular she is among the electorate, considering how easily, according to this poll, she would crush Joe Biden. I'm not trying to give him advice, obviously I don't wanna see a second Trump term. But I am kind of sharing this perspective with you all to give you a warning about what could happen moving forward with this election. It's very likely that Trump is gonna be the Republican nominee. There is some chance he could choose Nikki Haley as his running mate. And I do believe that that ticket would pose a massive threat to Biden and Kamala Harris. And so we don't know what's gonna happen. We don't know who Donald Trump is gonna choose. But even if he doesn't choose Nikki Haley, even if he goes for someone who's even wacky, like someone like uh, you know, um, Marjorie Green or Carrie Lake. It doesn't really matter because even without the consideration of a, a, a VP pick, you still have Donald Trump beating Joe Biden in the polls by four points. And remember, Joe Biden would need to beat Donald Trump by five points in order to comfortably clench the general election. So we'll see how this all plays out. I think it's important to kind of have a sobering look at the situation that we have moving forward. A lot of people don't like to hear this news. They like to hear all sorts of pretty little tales about how easily Joe Biden is going to win reelection. I don't think that's gonna be the case. I do think that the Democratic Party is really risking the future of the country and the the you know future of the executive branch by essentially ensuring that Joe Biden can continue with this fantasy reelection run. And if they are in fact concerned about the fate of our democratic process, which is what the Democrats are running on at the moment. Well, they've got a funny way of showing it because they're literally running the worst possible candidate against Donald Trump. So with all that said, we're gonna take a quick break. When we come back, Cenk Uger will be joining me for updates on the war in Gaza. Back on TYT, Jank and Anna with you guys. Also, Happy Warrior and Benjamin Webster. I can't tell if they just joined or gifted memberships, but either ways, we love you guys. Casper's got more news. We do. Unfortunately, the war in Gaza continues. Unfortunately, we're getting more and more horrifying footage from the Gaza Strip. So let's get to all the updates and details. Israel's flag now flies high in the center of Gaza City overlooking a desolate, apocalyptic landscape. This is one of the most intense assaults on a population the world has ever seen, and it's not over yet. More than 18,000 Gazans have died and thousands more are missing, buried under the rubble. Others are severely injured and are unable to get the health care they need as hospitals are unable to function due to a lack of fuel and due to repeated aerial bombardments by the Israeli Defense Forces. Now, with that said, the United States decided to be the sole country in the United Nations to basically veto a resolution that called for a ceasefire. Now, the Security Council vote on the resolution backed by Arab states had 13 in favor and one, the United States, against, while the United Kingdom abstained. US Deputy Representative to the UN, Robert Wood, said the resolution was rushed and ignored US diplomatic efforts to get more aid into Gaza and free hostages taken by Hamas militants in the October 7th attack on Israel. Now, what he left out of that ridiculous argument was, the absolute terror that civilians have been living with in Gaza as the IDF bombs not only the northern region of the Gaza Strip, but also the south. There is literally nowhere for anyone to go 
for them to be safe from these bombardments, from these bombings. Robert Wood also said that the resolution's authors declined to condemn Hamas's October 7th attack that killed 1,200 people, including women, children, and the elderly. Now, something I wouldn't have expected, but here we are. Senator Bernie Sanders, one of the top progressives in Congress, opposes a ceasefire. During a interview over the weekend on CBS News, he said the following, in terms of a permanent ceasefire, I don't know how you can have a permanent ceasefire when Hamas, who has said before October 7th and after September 7th, that they want to destroy Israel, they want a permanent war. I don't know how you have a permanent ceasefire with an attitude like that. Now, a ceasefire would protect the journalists, humanitarian aid workers, and doctors who have been you know, slaughtered by Israeli airstrikes, but no consideration for them. Because God forbid we actually consider the ratio of civilians that are getting killed versus alleged Hamas militants that the IDF is claiming that they're going after. Okay, so I believe that Bernie's in fire with the ceasefire resolution. He's just saying that he doesn't want a permanent ceasefire because how can you negotiate when Hamas wants to kill all the Jews? Well. Um, how do you negotiate when Israel won't end occupation for 56 years? So it's the number one problem is the occupation. And Bernie, to be fair, is on the right side of that. He doesn't want the occupation, he wants a two state solution, etc. But it, everybody's in, in America's favorite sport is ignoring the fact that these people have been kept in an open air prison for over 50 years now. So imagine just reverse the roles. And I know people get like really touchy when it's the same exact fact pattern, but you reverse the ethnicities. So if Jewish people had been kept in open air prisons for 56 years, would we all be like, how dare you fight back? You shouldn't love the, the Germans, you should love the Palestinians, you should love whoever it is. Oh, So what, they're keeping you in a ghetto and you have no rights and you have no country and you have no existence. Shut up and take it and love your occupier. And oh, by the way, if you fight back, it's your fault. Can you imagine that would be horrific if anyone did that to the Jews? It's also horrific when you do it to the Palestinians. These are super simple concepts. So, Cenk, you know, I've been seeing some pushback against the notion that Gazans had been living in an open air prison. Now, I know what you're referring to when you describe it that way, but I think it's worth revisiting why people describe the conditions in Gaza that way because there seem like there's this video that's like floating around. I don't know when that video was shot. It shows beautiful scenes of Gaza. Oh, but Gaza is so beautiful. How could this is be it? an open air prison? So talk about why it's referred to as an open air prison. So first of all, they they don't have their own sovereign state. That means they cannot make any decisions regarding foreign policy. And if they make any decisions domestically that Israel doesn't agree with, they can cut off the water the power, the electricity, they could drop 2,000 pound bombs on them and kill 18,000 of their civilians with no recourse, nothing. But okay? I think mean, Gazans can leave though, right? If they no, like they the cannot leave, oh, they, they do not leave. control their own borders, oh, they do okay. not control their own government. Interesting. They don't have any military, they, don't, they are not a country. So again, we have the great irony of Israeli supporters going, "Oh my God, if the Palestinians had it their way, Israel wouldn't be a country. Well, but Israel is a country. Because of Israel, Palestine is not a country. But you're not worried about it that at all because Palestinian lives don't matter, right? Be honest with yourself. You don't care about Palestinian lives at all, at all. Don't pretend that, oh, oops, did I occupy them for 56 years? All right, they, they can't control anything. And by the way, the minute that you disagree with Israel at all, or, or not even you, but someone else in, this, in the same area does something wrong, we're gonna come by, it doesn't matter if you're a dentist, a shopkeeper, or whatever you are, we're gonna strip you naked in the middle of the town. We're gonna gag your mouth and have you just wearing underwear, and then we're gonna take pictures of you and humiliate you in the whole world. Oh, By the way, that's after we kill your family. Yeah. But you see how it's your fault. So Bernie, I love you, brother, and you're right about 90% of it, and I appreciate you. But please don't tell me about how oh, it's Hamas's fault, the Palestinians fault for, for this problem being here in the first place, as we're gonna show you a little bit later in the program, Netanyahu has been trying to prop up Hamas. That's already horrible, so don't tell me oh, Hamas did something wrong. Well, then if that's the case, then it's Netanyahu's fault and it's the Israeli government's fault that has allowed Hamas to fester instead of getting to a two-state solution. But more importantly, 
The reason they uh, bolstered Hamas, according to reporting from the New York Times and almost every major paper in Israel, is because Netanyahu didn't want a two state solution. So he thought Hamas continuing to create problems for Israel and the Palestinian authorities in the West Bank would be helpful for him politically. No. So it is literally Netanyahu and the Israeli government who does not want peace, does not want a two state solution and wants a permanent occupation. They are totally guilty. I think it's important you know, when explosive claims like that are made, I think it's important to provide evidence for those claims. So I'm gonna do that right now because it sounds crazy. It sounds crazy for anyone to say that Benjamin Net Netanyahu would prop up Hamas. Let's go to graphic 10 here. So in March of 2019, Netanyahu told his Likud colleagues the following. I'm gonna read his quote verbatim. Anyone who wants to thwart the establishment of a Palestinian state has to support bolstering Hamas and transferring money to Hamas. This is part of our strategy to isolate the Palestinians in Gaza from the Palestinians in the West Bank. I didn't say it. We didn't make it up, we didn't even paraphrase, we read you his exact statement. So now the civilians who had been living in horrible conditions as a result of the Israeli government in the Gaza Strip now have to pay the consequences of what Hamas carried out on October 7th. And Hamas was propped up and funded by Benjamin Netanyahu. Isn't that so convenient? And specifically for the purpose of making sure that there was no peace deal. So you'll also hear BS talking points about, oh, we offered the Palestinians six, you know, six different peace deals. It's all their fault for not taking it. By the way, oh, here, let me come into your house, take three quarters of your house, and then say, what? I gave you a quarter back. You didn't take the peace deal. It's totally your fault. That's why I had to keep the whole house, right? right? Absurd, point one. Point two is, well, are, are those same people gonna say, it's all the Israeli government's fault because here for two decades straight, they have had a concerted plan that even the Israeli papers confirm to make sure that the Palestinians could not get a peace deal. So aren't they just as guilty as Hamas? <gasps> well, oh my God, they killed 10 times as many civilians, but you can't say they're as guilty as Hamas. You can't say that, we'll ban you, we'll cancel you. If you're a university president, we'll, if someone is doing a theoretical chant, we'll make sure your life is ruined. But kill 10 times as many Palestinians, make sure there's never any peace. Oh, you're perfectly good, hey, you're an ally, you're a democracy. Come on, get out of here, I mean, not anywhere near close. Now, with that said, I do think it's interesting to see how media has had no choice but to pivot to the reality of what's happening on the ground in Gaza. Jake Tapper, I think, is a prime example of that because we're not just hearing about high civilian death tolls, we're also hearing about dozens of journalists getting slaughtered as a result of Israel's aerial bombardments in the Gaza Strip. Let's watch. The Committee to Protect Journalists says at least 63 journalists and members of the news media have been killed, 56 of them Palestinian, in this war, presumably mostly if not entirely by IDF strikes. Is that acceptable to you? You've made a press freedom a hallmark of your, of your term. How do you explain all these deaths of journalists? How do the Israelis explain it? When it comes to uh, instances where journalists have been killed. Um, we want to make sure that that's investigated uh, and we understand what's happened and there's accountability. You know, there's been a lot of fear over a growing number of Americans who are starting to question liberalism, right? Human rights, everything that the American government purports to care about and want to protect. And the reason why they're second guessing it, if you ask me, is because the very values that fall under the umbrella of liberalism seem to be hollow, seem to be nothing more than cheap talk by those in power, by the elite. And that's what you're seeing right there. I mean, you have Secretary of State Anthony Blinken 
pretending as though he has any concern for the dozens of journalists who have been slaughtered in the Gaza Strip, we're supposed to want to protect. That's what, I mean, it's a big part of liberalism, wanting to protect the press, wanting to protect freedom of speech. But we have a situation in which dozens upon dozens of journalists have been killed. And all you get from Anthony Blinken is, well, you know, we, we, we're we concerned about that. We're gonna investigate it. Are no. you? Though? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you? They're working around the clock. They got people working in shifts on it. Okay, guys, here's more stats. Again, this is, I'm probably gonna be called anti Semitic for giving you numbers, okay? So Hamas killed six reporters on October 7th. Awful, horrific, terrible. Everybody agrees. What a bunch of no good terrorists, right? Israel has killed 63 reporters. A bunch of suckers going around going, Oh, I bet it was all collateral damage. I bet it was all an accident. Golly gee, the Israeli Defense Forces have the worst aim in the world. Hamas meant to kill the six reporters, but Israel didn't mean to kill any of the 63 reporters who were, by the way, coincidentally happened to be there to document the ethnic cleansing that is going on in Palestine now and in Gaza. Are you joking? I mean, when you make points like this, don't you get a little embarrassed, maybe even humiliated? Yes, yeah. they're obviously killing them on purpose, and we're obviously not going to do anything about it. And why on purpose? I don't mean like, hey, I don't like that guy and that guy. They've done that in the past. With Abu an Ameri- That's right, with an American journalist, okay? But in this case, they're like, oh, there's journalists in the area. I don't care. Who cares? Just drop a 2,000 pound bomb. Kill, 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 kill. Oh, oops, it was all 18,000 people dead, all an accident. No one outside of the propaganda filled heads inside Washington believes you guys. No one believes you. Okay, so I want to move on to the casualties and others who have been killed, individuals who had just recently done press interviews about what they were experiencing in the Gaza Strip. So let's go to graphic five here, where the Israel Defense Forces struck more than 250 sites across Gaza and was fighting fiercely in Khan Yunus, the largest southern city, and in the northern neighborhoods of Jabalia and Shejaya. And look, I mean, that makes it clear. They're obviously doing aerial bombardments at every region of the Strip. There is nowhere to evacuate to for safety. The UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs said that multiple health facilities and personnel were attacked across Gaza over the weekend and that three medical workers were shot while trying to retrieve medical supplies for hospitals at health ministry warehouses. This is according to reporting from the Washington Post. And also a 44 year old Palestinian poet by the name of Rafat Al-Arir was also killed by the IDF just weeks after he told CNN that he and his family have no choice but to remain in the north because they have nowhere to go. And here is one of his final interviews before he was killed. We know that it's very bleak, it's very dark, Uh there's no way out. Uh, If if there's no water, there's no uh, way out of Gaza. What should we do, like drown, like commit mass suicide? Is this what Israel wants? And we're not going to do that. And I was telling some somebody, some friend the other day that I'm an academic. I Probably the toughest thing I have at, at home is an expo marker. But if the Israelis invade, if they charge at us, charge at us, open door to door to massacre us, I'm going to use that marker, throw it at the Israeli soldiers. He says, all I have is an expo marker and he, he'll throw it at them. That's that's the only line of defense he has. Weeks I- later on, hold on, on December 7th, al was killed by a strike in Northern Gaza. His friend and colleague, uh, Jihad Ab Salim, confirmed to CNN. Uh, he was staying with his brother, his sister and her four children who were all killed. Okay, here's another question that everybody in Washington, the liars, the hypocrites, the guys funding genocide right now would find outrageous. So if Israel has a right to defend itself and everyone agrees that they do, do the Palestinians have a right to defend themselves? No, they don't apparently. No, right? I mean, like, let's be honest, Washington. Everyone in Washington says that Israel has a right to defend itself by killing 10 times as many civilians as Hamas, the terrorist group. You see how they're not terrorists, even though they kill 10 times as many civilians, and we're just getting started. 
They're gonna broaden, they're, now we're gonna tell you later on the show, they're looking to broaden the war and they said move to the south. And as Anna just told you, they're bombing the hell out of the south. I mean, you're seeing the pictures, guys. Family members being picked out of the rubble one body part at a time. The whole place is obliterated. We've never seen civilian casualties like this. The New York Times reporting. In 20 years in, Af in the war in Afghanistan, we killed less civilians than Israel killed in two months. And you're telling me they were all accidental killing of civilians? No, they're massacring the civilians. They're doing it right in front of all of our eyes and America blocks any resolution that would stop them. Green light, green light. So look, I used to hate it when people would say like, "Oh, genocide Joe. I thought that sounds ugly, that's too far for about Joe Biden. But if you're gonna send $14 billion to actively commit a genocide, well, what should we call you? So do the Palestinians have a right to defend themselves? Or are they the only people on earth who must submit to their own massacres? So end their own occupation. Do they have any rights as human beings? No, Washington says over and over again, Palestinians are not human. They will never be treated as human and we will send more money today to go murder them. That's exactly what Congress is doing now. Oh, We're so concerned about hypothetical chance on college campus. Fire anyone who disagrees with Israel, okay? Because we're concerned about genocide. Oh, By the way, next we'll be voting on genocide. And we will almost all of us vote yes to genocide and send your money. You worked so hard at your job. Are we gonna give your kids anything? Education, healthcare, anything? No. We're gonna take your money and we're gonna send it over to butcher those Palestinians. Don't spare me, spare me any BS about how you care about human rights, how you care about genocide, how you care about protecting people as we continue to fund massacre after massacre, daily massacres by the Israeli government. Let's take a break. I agree with everything Jenk just said. He's absolutely correct. And this is all happening in our names as American citizens. Uh, and by the way, Anthony Blinken in that same interview that I showed you earlier uh, said, but don't worry about it. You know, some of that money uh, that we're sending to Israel comes back to the United States in the form of Israel buying weapons from our weapons manufacturers. Oh, wow, great. I, I guess I should feel better about what we're seeing taking place uh, in, in the Gaza Strip right now. <sighs> when we come back, uh, horrifying footage of just. The IDF dehumanizing civilians, stripping them down to their underwear, lots to get to. I'm sorry that this is such a terrible dark story, but we gotta give you the details. So we'll be right back with that and more. Back on TYT, Jenk, Anna, Nazone 7. Everyone who signs up is basically voting with their dollars to say, yes, I want you to be honest. Yes, I want you to tell the truth. We appreciate you guys. Join buttons below, tyt.com slash join, Anna. Just wanna warn you before our next story, the images are difficult to look at. The topic is difficult to discuss. Yes, we have more coverage of the war in Gaza. And so with that warning in mind, let's get to it. In Northern Gaza, more images of Palestinian men stripped to their underwear being detained. This man hands over an assault rifle, though many question why, if they are Hamas fighters, there are so few weapons, and why the men were forced to strip before handing them over. Palestinians say the man is a civilian, the owner of a small business in Beit Lahia. We're going to revisit the story of the man holding the rifle in just a moment. But the Israeli Defense Forces have actually been forced to apologize following the emergence of the shocking and humiliating footage that we just showed you. Shows Palestinian men, civilians stripped down to their underwear, absolutely humiliated. In some cases, the men were handcuffed and blindfolded. We have more details on it in the next video. This is a video that you can see here of these men stripped down to their underwear on the ground. These individuals are being forced to kneel also in their underwear with their hands bound. These are being transported in trucks. And again, the original story we're getting is, oh, these are all Hamas militants who are surrendering. You can see this man 
who is carrying a, a gun and he is coming forward and laying it down. One of the uh, immediate questions that emerged here is you're about to see another version of the same video and Al Jazeera and others reporting that it appears they made this man do this twice for their little propaganda video that they're filming here. And uh, this man has been identified as a small business owner, by the way, with no known ties to Hamas. And I think it's worth talking to or hearing from uh, one of the men who experienced this firsthand and how the men were treated. Let's watch. A group of Palestinian men released after being held by Israeli forces for five days spoke about the treatment they faced. They took off our clothes, slapped us, kicked us, grabbed us like animals and dragged us on the ruined ground with sand and stones. They did not care, they just wanted to take us to their place. And after that they gagged us and I felt like they were going to kill us. Now, initially, the IDF claimed that they were doing this to all the men in the Gaza Strip who they suspected of being terrorists. <laughs> Later, the IDF was forced to correct themselves and claim that only 10 to 15 percent of them were. But I would even take that with a grain that's, of salt. There's no chance. I would take true. it with a grain of salt. Let's just. They, they have lied repeatedly. You can't trust anything that comes out of their mouths. You can't trust anything that comes out of Hamas's mouth. So fog of war, we don't know for sure. But the fact that they went from they're all you know suspected terrorists to 10 to 15 percent of them were, I think, is telling. Haaretz citing the assessment of senior defense officials reported that only 10 to 15 percent of those arrested men are thought to be affiliated with Hamas. That they're even thought to be affiliated. Yeah. And so why did you bring everybody out? Now this is the idea of admitting it. Because you wanted to humiliate the Palestinians, show them who's boss, who runs the place. You want to rub their faces in it. And then afterwards you say, why don't they love Israel? We had to kill them because they don't love the Jews and they don't love Israel. At what point were they supposed to fall in love with you? If you were, if the Jews were humiliated like that, I would fight anyone to make it stop. I would say we've got to do everything in our power to make it stop. Why? Because honestly, I, I grew up with Jewish friends and I have Jewish family. But I, I barely know any Palestinians. I'm worried that I am too biased, even me. Like, if this happened to Jewish Americans, we'd all be going nuts. If it happened to Jews, we'd be like, how could you do this after all that they have suffered? To strip them naked like this in their underwear and humiliate them, let alone killing their family. But when it's done to Palestinians, as angry as I get on the show, I don't think I'm anywhere near angry enough. And I'm sorry to all the Palestinians out there. We should all be livid. We should all be furious and looking to tear down this American government that says $14 billion to do this to your people. I'm so sorry on behalf of the monsters in Washington. The grotesque monsters that fund the genocide of your people. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I feel such deep shame as an American seeing that we have a government that supports this wholeheartedly, totally supports this. There's all sorts of cheap talk coming from the Biden administration about how like, oh, well, we ask politely if they can please consider the lives of the civilians in the Gaza Strip. As they intensify their bombardments, as more and more stories come out of journalists being slaughtered, of healthcare workers and doctors being slaughtered, of ambulances being targeted and bombed. Healthcare workers being shot at as they go to hospitals to try to retrieve any type of supplies they can get their hands on to try to treat people who were wounded as a result of those bombardments. I feel deep shame because this is all happening in our names and we're all supposed to pretend like justice is being served. As if what, what this is doing is gonna somehow keep the Israeli population safe from another repeat of October 7th. But we know what the reality is. We know that as they are doing these bombardments, as they're wiping out entire families, this is breeding more extremism. They know it, we know it, but we're just sitting here and allowing it to happen. And I feel so ashamed of that.
With that said, though, I, I want to talk about the doctors and journalists um, who were, you know, part of the group of men uh, who were humiliated like this. The Times of Israel reports that London based Arabic language news outlet Al Arabi Al Jadid said on Thursday that among those Palestinians stripped down to their underwear was its reporter, Dia Al Khalut, and members of his family. The Committee to Protect Journalists, a US based nonprofit group that promotes press freedom worldwide, said it was alarmed by reports of his detention along with members of his family. In fact, there is footage of him as he was being detained and humiliated. Let's take a look. And NBC reported on who these men actually were. So even before Israel admitted, that many of these men were civilians. You can see this individual who's um, circled here. This is a journalist. This is a journalist for at the New Arabs Arabic Service. Others are relatives of a DC based fundraiser for a UN agency. So people were able to spot civilians in this picture in these pictures. Mainstream outlets actually um, you know, did journalism and exposed that these were not in fact all Hamas militants. And I think that's what pressured the IDF to actually come out and have to apologize. Now, what is Israel also saying about the footage that's coming out? I think it's worth hearing from Mark Regev, who of course is an advisor to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. He had an interview with Sky News and get a load of what he had to say, the excuse that he gave for what's currently transpiring. He said, quote, remember it's the Middle East and it's warmer here, especially during the day when it's sunny to be asked to Take your shirt, take off your shirt. It might not be pleasant, but it's not the end of the world. Oh, Mark. that man is disgusting. I'm absolutely disgusted by what he said there. So Mark Regev is a monster, and and he's along with the rest of the Israeli government and their spokespeople are totally responsible for the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, and. So he comes out, you were, oh, you were doing them a favor because it's hot. That's why you had them take off their shirt. Like you, we don't have eyes. We can't see that you're doing it to humiliate them and to rub their face in the fact that you occupy them and you hold absolute power over them. And they go, ha ha, you're not human. We can do anything we want to you. And you think that helps the cause of Jews across the world? Are you insane? Look, you're driving endless hatred, stop. Stop, because it's not just about how badly you're humiliating those Palestinians and how you're enraging 1.6 billion Muslims. It's because the damage you're doing to the Jewish cause to do this publicly in front of the whole world and say, this is what we do. No, don't do that, don't do that. And look at all of the terrible excuses. They found one guy with a gun, the shopkeeper, and they say, why don't the Palestinians fight back against Hamas? And then when a shopkeeper has a, a weapon to potentially fight back against the thugs in Hamas, they're like, ah, terrorists, all oh, the Palestinian men are terrorists. Yeah, you guys are liars. And I don't, when I say you guys, the Israeli government officials, these right wing monsters constantly talking about, we're gonna take Gaza, flying the Israeli flag in the middle of Gaza City after turning it into rubble. And rubbing their face in it in every way. We're gonna ethnically cleanse you, we're gonna do a genocide, and we're gonna humiliate you, and there's nothing you could do about it. You see how great we are? Why don't you love us? Come on, guys, it's insanity. And unfortunately, everyone in Washington is like, oh, yeah, totally good, A okay. The Biden administration, what a bunch of liars, okay? I wanna be absolutely clear, they're all complete liars. They are. Because they, Stop the ceasefire resolution in the UN, which is a giant green light to Israel. They vetoed it. Yep. They vetoed it. They said, keep killing, keep slaughtering, yep. right? Oh, by the way, we're about to send you $14 billion so you can slaughter more innocent Palestinians. But we have told our friends that maybe they should be a little bit more careful while they're murdering journalists and citizens. And then I wonder if Anthony Blinken and the rest go home and go, <laughs> look at all the cleansing that we funded while we pretended that we care about Palestinians. Oh, Israel, be a little careful. Green light. <laughs> Jesus Christ, man, have you no morality? Anthony Blinken, Joe Biden. By the way, not just those guys. How many voted against the $14 billion resolution in the House? What was it, 13 or 14? 
I don't know the exact it was number, a tiny, but a tiny percentage. Tiny number, all progressives, by the way. The rest of well, them. Well, one Republican. Massey. Oh, that's right, Tom Massey, yeah. too. A great credit to him. Oh, are you going to catch feelings for giving credit to Tom Massey? No, he deserves credit. Yeah, he, he deserves, deserves giant credit. Yeah. credit, okay? And so, but the rest of them, hundreds and hundreds of Congress people, not just Republicans, almost all the Democrats, kill, 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 kill. But we're really concerned about somebody chanting about genocide on a college campus. Allegedly. Allegedly. But let's fund this genocide. Hey, it's a quick question for the Congress. When you guys vote to send money to the genocide, are you guys all gonna chant? Or are you just like, I don't know, I, 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 maybe you are. Because chanting for genocide, as long as it's Palestinians, is totally acceptable in America. Sending money to effectuate the genocide, perfectly acceptable. In fact, if you don't do it, anti-Semite is what they say. You know, Nonsense, I no one believes your crap anymore. You can spew all that garbage in Washington, but now you guys are on an island. And you've lost the country and you've lost the world. And you're all funding genocide and we know it. We can, we have eyes, we see it. Well, we've been- Can, can I, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. can I say one last thing? Guys, there is a productive solution to all this. We don't have to get angry, we don't have to fund genocide. We don't have to go with this propaganda. The number one problem why this still exists is that there's no peace deal. If you actually wanted to stop Hamas and you actually wanted to bring peace to Israel, which is what we should all want. The whole point of Israel was to be a safe haven for Jews who desperately needed it throughout the world. That's definitely true. In order to be a safe haven, you you know what you do? Not 56 years of war and occupation, you do a peace deal. It's not pe like hippie peacenik stuff. No, it's very, very practical. Israel did a peace deal with Egypt, it completely worked. There was no more conflict, no more terrorism, no more a war and killing each other after the peace deal. End the occupation, do a peace deal right now, and Israel is safe and the Palestinians have human dignity. It's actually very, very, very simple. The only reason that the right wing government of Israel isn't doing it is because they would like to steal more Palestinian land. And they will, and we're gonna let them, and we're gonna aid and abet that process. We're doing it as we speak. And no, Jake, I think you're wrong. That's not the heart of the problem. The heart of the problem is the Israel lobby, okay? It's not a Jewish lobby, it is the Israel lobby. The Israel lobby actually consists of a lot of evangelical Christians who salivated the notion of the end times. And so they want to keep Israel a Jewish state for the second coming of God in order to you know, have that judgment day in which some Jewish people will convert to Christianity and those who don't will be absolutely destroyed. They'll burn in eternal damnation, okay? These are people in the United States who are part of an incredibly powerful lobby to ensure that there's no peace in that region of the world, to ensure that this constant war is never ending. Okay, that, that's the heart of the problem, Cenk. And people get real touchy when you talk about the Israel lobby, even though there are interest groups corrupting politicians all over Washington as we speak. It's okay to mention that, but you can't mention the Israel lobby. You can't mention AIPAC, you can't mention the Democratic majority for Israel. They're the ones who have the say, not you or I, okay? Not the people sitting here at this desk or the people in this studio. They're the ones who make the decisions about what the policy should be in regard to United States support for Israel. And it's gonna be that way until we do something about money in politics. It is a virus that infects every single policy decision Washington makes, period. And the people who end up suffering the most when it comes to this particular issue are innocent civilians in Gaza and also the West Bank, by the way. The West Bank, which is not governed by Hamas, the West Bank where illegal settlements are supported by the Israeli government. They have no problem doing that and they have no excuse to do it, but they do it anyway with our support. We never go after or against Israel and what they want. And it's not because the US government is full to the brim of politicians who agree with what Israel is doing. It's that the government is full to the brim with politicians who have been corrupted by the Israel lobby and will do whatever the Israel lobby wants them to do. That is what's happening. I know people get real offended by that, but that's the truth. There's an entire book written about it. Anyway, you yeah. should read it. Yeah, guys, if you, you could say, "Oh, I'm offended at the things that are 100% true." Go ahead and get offended. But if you're denying that AIPAC, a Democratic majority for Israel, any evangelical Christians spend 
tens of millions of dollars uh, uh, buying off our politicians, you are factually incorrect. They, they, are, they definitely do it, it is well documented and they brag about it. They say, oh, we eliminated Nina Turner. If you dared oppose us, we'll eliminate you. You must sign a loyalty pledge saying Israel can do no wrong. And they have dogs like John Fetterman. I don't know if he's gonna walk around in a leash soon. But go, yes, sir, absolutely, sir. And he admits, "Oh, I did it because I, I didn't wanna get hurt by this lobby in the middle of my Senate run. Okay, so let's be honest about what's happening. Saying things that are patently, obviously true, factually true, proven by numbers and quotes. We'll get you banned in Washington. Can, can, can I just say one final thing about these end time lunatics, okay, yeah. the evangelicals? Um, I find it so hilarious that as they continue pushing for the types of policies that slaughter, okay, countless women, children, innocent civilians, they think that what they're supporting is somehow gonna eventually lead to them living this fantasy world like in heaven. No, no, if heaven and hell exist, They'll be the first to go to hell, and I'll enjoy it. Yeah, I Talks. hope you don't catch feelings over that. You say no, we're no. all going to go to hell, <laughs> and you love it. You're like, ha, 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 you're going to be left behind. You're all going to be murdered by my God, and I'm going to be the only one in heaven. And now all of a sudden, if we reverse it, you're like, oh, how dare you say I'm going to hell? Yes, if you're a fundamentalist evangelical Christian, looking forward to the end times, and hence looking to fund the murder of Palestinians, yes, you're. Definitely going to hell. If hell exists, you've got a prime time seat in hell for the more immoral crimes that you have committed. You should repent of your sins. All right, when we come back for the second hour of the show, we're gonna get into the testimony that university presidents gave before a House committee last week and the fallout following that committee hearing. A lot to get to when we come back, don't miss it.